what a great day. I'd like to welcome you to this, uh, this luncheon. Um, what a great event for the, uh, for the Covey Center. Uh, we've had marvelous meetings, uh, student forum, and with the uh, Covey Fellows already. Uh, we're just delighted uh, that we're able to, to stage this kind of event and have such a distinguished visitor as we have today. So what we'd like to do, um, we're going to flip-flop the program a little bit due to schedules. We're going to begin with a, uh, a few remarks from Dean Anderson, who will, re who will introduce uh, Boyd Craig, who will give the official uh, an award to Lord Hastings. And then we'll have Lord Hastings uh, talk, followed by lunch. So with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Dean Anderson. Dean Anderson? We are met today in memory of our dear friend Stephen R. Covey uh, and in honor of Lord Michael Hastings. And I must say to you that this is one of the signal events of this school since I've had the privilege of being dean. Uh, together with us today are two of uh, Stephen Covey's uh, children, illustrious children, I might say, uh, Marie and also Stephen M. R. Covey, and we're delighted. And Joshua, I sorry, Joshua, I may have done this to you the last time, and I hope I beg your indulgence. I'm so glad that you're able to be here with us. Uh, I was just explaining to Lord Hastings that uh, I was going to have to leave somewhat early because uh, President Cockett, who is unable to be with us here today, uh, has asked me to represent her at the inauguration of the new president at USC. And so I have a flight I need to catch uh, this afternoon. Uh, but uh, tomorrow is also significant because uh, USC uh, will be playing Utah in the Coliseum, uh, where they have not won since 1916. Uh, so it's a big game tomorrow. It's, it's doubly significant because my father was, got his doctorate degree at USC and was a dean there uh, for quite a number of years. Uh, and two of my children, my daughter Amy, went to medical school at USC and my uh, daughter Emily got a master's degree in occupational therapy from there. Uh, so my wife Kathy, who is a graduate of the University of Utah, asked me uh, who I was going to be rooting for. Uh, and since I'm going to be in the president's suite, I need to be somewhat discreet. But I did explain to her that since my father has passed away and on the other side of the veil, he'll be otherwise engaged. And my daughters are very forgiving. But I live with my wife. Uh, and the, the actual thing that actually made it uh, uh, unquestionable is that Britton Covey, Stephen M. R.'s son uh, is, in my opinion, one of the most exciting football players today, and he'll be playing for the Utes. So I'm rooting for the Utes uh, tomorrow night. Uh, you know, the Covey family has been an extraordinary uh, gift to the state of Utah and indeed to the world. Uh, and we are so privileged to have a center for leadership uh, named in honor of Stephen R. Covey. And I know that he would be absolutely delighted that the first recipient of the fir very first Stephen R. Covey Principal Centered Leadership Award will go to Lord Michael Hastings of Great Britain. Uh, I've had a chance to learn about Lord Michael in anticipation of this event. Uh, I, and uh, I've watched interviews, extensive interviews with him. There is a wonderful TED Talk that he gives. And in particular, I was moved by a speech that he gave, the keynote speech, at the uh, prayer breakfast of the president of Kenya uh, that was attended also by the president of the South Sudan. Yeah, just, I believe it was in May of this year. And I encourage you all to take a look at what he had to say. In the most graceful, the kindest, most supportive way possible, and with great humor and great love and affection 
for the people in that audience, he called the leaders of Africa to a higher standard of accountability, a transparency, and caring for their own people. And I believe these are exactly and precisely the values that Stephen stood for. Honesty, integrity, uh, but always helping people with a challenge to think of how they could lift themselves and their associates to a higher standard of performance, a higher standard of possibility, a higher standard of excellence, and indeed a higher standard of caring and service. So Lord Michael, it is a deed an honor to have you here with us. And to make the formal introduction, I'd like to introduce my dear friend, Boyd Craig. And let me say just a word about Boyd. Boyd for 27 years, Boyd, something like that, was Stephen R. Covey's alter ego and the silent partner behind many of the things that Stephen wrote and said and did. Uh, and it's not taking a thing away from Stephen Covey to acknowledge the tremendous uh, debt that the Covey Leadership Center and later Franklin Covey uh, and Stephen himself owe to Boyd Craig. Uh, we had the privilege of, of having Stephen attend and give a keynote address to one of our Shingo conferences. Uh, and Ken Snyder, was that 2009? 2009 in Nashville, Tennessee. And I had the privilege of being there with him at that time. And Stephen came home from that conference and said to Boyd, I think there's something special going on up at Utah State University at the Huntsman School of Business. Why don't you see what we might develop together? And that was the first time I began to work with Boyd, but I knew him well through his family and through his father, uh, with whom I had been a uh, father-in-law, with whom I had been associated for, for many years. And the, the relationship deepened and blossomed and then uh, a year later, we were able to name Stephen as the first John M. Huntsman uh, presidential chair in leadership at the Huntsman School of Business. Uh, and it was a great, great honor for us to be associated with Stephen during his final two and a half years of life. And it was through, again, the association that I had with Boyd that I made uh, um, uh, the acquaintance of, of Stephen's uh, children, and notably the three who are here, but the others as well. Uh, and this has been a very, very rich and engaging relationship. And it is, again, through Boyd that we have the privilege of knowing now uh, Lord Hastings and his son Kenny, who have joined with us today. So won't you join me in welcoming Boyd Craig to this dais? Dear friends, it's such a, an honor to be here with you today, and our dear friend, Michael Hastings, what an honor to have you here with us. And what a great thing to honor you today in the name of Stephen R. Covey. I'd like to begin by sharing a brief story from Stephen's life as a way of framing this award and the intersection of two of the truly great men on the earth, Stephen R. Covey and Lord Michael Hastings. When Stephen was a young man in college, he decided to interrupt his studies to serve as a volunteer missionary he received a call to go to England. And just four and one half months into his service, the president came to him and said, I have an assignment for you. I'd like you to travel throughout the country 
and train local leaders. Stephen was shocked. He thought, who am I, a young kid, 20 years old, to be training men two and three times my age to be leaders? And seeing the concern in his eye, this president looked at him and said, Stephen, I have great confidence in you. You can do this. You will do it superbly. I'll share with you materials that you can use, and I am here to support you. And with that vote of confidence, he undertook the assignment and started traveling around the country training leaders. It was a watershed experience in his life, for he made a great discovery that in the combination of a leader that believed in him, beyond his present capacity, and armed with principles that empower people, extraordinary change and growth can happen in human lives and in organizations. This shaped his life, and as he came home from this volunteer service, he decided, and really he discovered, this is my purpose in life. It's to unleash human potential. To see it and communicate it so clearly that people are inspired to see it in themselves. He dedicated his life to that end. You know, he was raised in a family of business people. And everything in his life up to that point had been to groom him to take over in that business. Hotels, transportation, real estate. Uh, but coming off this experience, he thought, that's not my future. That's not my purpose. I want to be a teacher. And I want to teach people principles that will endure, that are self-evident, that are universal, that are timeless that will empower them to lead a life of great contribution. So he made a choice to be true to that purpose and to teach the world principles, principle-centered leadership. And everything followed that. All of his influence came as a result of seeking to serve men and women throughout the world. Purpose and principles. Lord Hastings, this signature of Stephen's life is why you have been chosen as the first recipient of the Stephen R. Covey Principal Center Leadership Award. Because your life and your heart and your dedication to serve a purpose and to live and empower other with principles is what's lead to your, led to your own contributions of your life. So you are cut from the same cloth. And as the dean said, it's why I'm confident Stephen would be so pleased with his name attached to this honor for such a man as you. And so uh, your life your service as a teacher, your service as a television uh, leader, uh, your work in public relations in the BBC, your work with KPMG as the global head of uh, citizenship, the honors that have come to you from the Queen to serve in the House of Lords, all these are honors and opportunities that came because of a choice you made in your youth to dedicate yourself to God and to live a life of principle that would serve those of greatest need in the world. So it's not because of those honors that we honor you. It's because of your character. 
and the principles you've given yourself to and your dedication to serving others that you are being given this ward. There's a quote that is dear to my heart that to me when I think of you and when I think of Stephen embodies both of you. And is a quote by one of the most consequential religious leaders of the 19th century, the founder and president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Joseph Smith. And he said that a man filled with the love of God is not content with blessing his family alone, but ranges through the whole earth anxious to bless the whole human race. Stephen M. R., would you come join me, please? Lord Hastings. In behalf of the Stephen R. Covey Leadership Center at the Huntsman School of Business and in behalf of Utah State University is our deep honor to present to you the Stephen R. Covey Principal Centered Leadership Award. Thank you very much. And Lord Hastings, the true introduction to why you've been given this award is the time that is now yours to share whatever is in your heart. Thank you. Dean Anderson and uh, my dear friend Boyd, Stephen and many of the Covey family who are here. Uh, and for all of you, I, I, um, there, there are not many occasions in life when you feel overwhelmed, but I, but I do. I do feel overwhelmed, and uh, I feel overwhelmed because I believe that I'm still at the beginning of the things I must do. And the challenge is in life that, that I need to fulfill and the calls that I haven't yet made right. So to receive um, a, an award of this nature is, it, it's, it's, it's exceptional, it's beautiful, uh, it's compelling, but it's fearful because it carries with it a burden which goes deep into my own heart and I was just reflecting earlier on with some of you that, that uh, age is not the boundary of our potential. Uh, principles, purposes, commitments, covenants, determination, the acts of the spirit and the will, these are the things that decide whether at 70 we have something useful to be, or at 17 we've given up. And both can happen. So I do feel, as I'm deeply grateful to all of you for thinking of me, and I, and I, I genuinely wonder why on earth you did, but as I think of that, I say to you, um, I will treasure the chance to serve the purpose of this award in recognition of your father and what he left as a deposit of the greatest jewels the world can ever know and see them replicated wherever I can and make sure that what sits in front of me, much as what sits in front of you, is going to be no abandonment of principle. No matter how high a man or woman may climb and no matter how far we may go in in the journey that life gives us, in all of us come across a moment where we have to ask, what am I really doing? And who am I doing this for? 
So maybe I could just share some thoughts with you, and um, you could you could hold me to account for what I'm going to share with you. And if if I don't get it right, then please feel free to challenge me strongly. Um, I'm up for that. I I'm not a philosopher. Uh, I'm not even a proper theologian, although I studied theology, but I think I barely got through, but never mind. Um, <laughs> let's try. Uh, don't give up if you don't make it well, just try again. Um, I'm sure you all know the term Machiavellian. Uh, we often think of Machiavellians as kind of people who twist things to get their own way. Somebody who's a little bit distorting is Machiavellian. And Machiavellian people are to be generally avoided. But I did a little bit of study around Machiavelli and found out that this great 15th century Italian poet, yes, um, knew how to make words manage their way to change minds, but he also understood something very, very significant that I have battled with in the fight for how can you help people be more purposeful. He said this, there is nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things. Life becomes very quickly established. And when it becomes established, the establishment resists change. And all of us feel we must fall in line. After all, they know better. Stephen Hawkins, the great English professor, a chemist, an academic, a bright man, uh, unclear about his spiritual reality, died last year, uh, ironically buried in Westminster Abbey. I say ironically because he wasn't convinced of faith, but never mind, I'm sure Westminster Abbey will wake him up many times and <laughs> help him to think about why he's there. But he spent five decades searching for the black hole. Maybe you've not spent a second, and I don't think I've spent many seconds, looking up at night for a black hole. I'm sure here in the extreme beauty of what is around us, you can look up at night without that massive light pollution, and you can see the stars, and you just marvel. How did they hang there? And Stephen Hawkins believed that there was something way beyond the stars. Anyway, five decades passed, and he never managed to see a black hole. And then this year, on the 10th of April, a 29-year-old woman called Katie Borman took the first ever photograph of a black hole. Now, it's a digital photograph, so it doesn't mean to say that a camera, even an iPhone 11, was capable of capturing the image it wasn't one of those. It was put together from telescopes in eight different places around the world, from Antarctica to Argentina, uh, across Africa and Asia. And the imagery, the digital imagery, captured the first ever black hole. Katie Borman, at 29, saw what Stephen Hawkins, at 70, never saw. She worked since the age of 23, with a clear determination. Working out of MIT, she had absolutely made up her mind that she would dedicate herself to creating the algorithm necessary to capture the imagery. And on the 10th of April, her picture, the picture of the radiance of the black hole is on every major newspaper front page in the Western world. And she was interviewed immediately afterwards, after she listened to the comments of multiple scientists who affirmed that this was a moment in scientific history which was cataclysmic. This was significant, a sweet moment, somebody said, 
a life-changing moment. Science has shifted our knowledge to new paradigms. It's true. But when she was interviewed, she said her passion was coming up with ways to see or measure things that are invisible. Her passion, coming up with ways to see or measure the things that are invisible. That's remarkable. How do you see things that are invisible? How do you measure things that are invisible? How do you capture the invisible? You and I spend our time in the presence of the invisible all day long. You long for integrity. It's invisible. But without it, we're not sure of who you are. We're desperate for truth. It's invisible. But without it, we can't make good decisions. We know that love counts deeply within us. But if you try to box it or even turn it into a smell, it's not possible to commercialize it. Only its outcomes, not its reality. We know that without a purpose, which is invisible, there's no point. Our lives are built on the invisible. And God is invisible. But we're told that by faith, we see him. So we live lives that, based on the invisible, give us genuine freedom. And science has acknowledged that that moment of invisible capture was one of the most significant moments in modern history. I've been studying the skills thinking of the World Economic Forum for the last 13 years in my time at KPMG. I was privileged to go to the World Economic Forum in Davos in Switzerland every year. Um, a strange place to go, uh, way up in the mountains of Switzerland. It's minus 10 to 15 degrees centigrade. You can work that out in Fahrenheit. I, I know you think differently to us, but there you go. Um, kind of like we thought before you, but there you go. And, um, <laughs> and uh, uh, once you're up there, you're kind of trapped, so you can understand why the political and economic and business leaders of the world go there and spend four days and think great thoughts together. And they do. And I've been a great respecter of Klaus Schwab, this Austrian philosopher who created around him from the 1970s a mechanism to, as he said, improve the state of the world by pulling people together who have power, economic, social, financial, political, and challenge them to shift that power towards the benefit of a wider humanity. And every year, the World Economic Forum publishes an assessment of the skills that are necessary to shape the world in a way that makes the world wholesome and prosperous, meaningful. So here are the 2020 next year skills. I'm not going to read you all 10, but you can look up the list on the World Economic Forum website. It starts with complex problem solving. Knowing how to figure things out. Putting the attention of mind to make something intricate out of something impossible. Critical thinking. Creativity. But within the 10, emotional intelligence service orientation, judgment and decision-making. I love it. I love it that the World Economic Forum is saying to business, to politics, to societal leaders, listen, listen, listen. Yes, the economic imperatives are dynamic, but unless there is a set of positive outcomes that come from service and engagement of the emotion with reality, and a creative mindset that comes from principles, all you will achieve is just more dots on the GDP. 
you won't shift the dial of progress. Progress is not found in the progression of accounts, but it is found in the transformation of others' potential. They just published the 2022 skills. So here we are leaping on to when some of you may well have stepped beyond the borders of this great establishment and gone on into your own futures. Analytical thinking is there at the top still and innovation, active learning is next, but right here, emotional intelligence, leadership and social influence. We will never escape the necessity, the fundamental need that actually if our mind and our spirit are not co-alert, it doesn't matter what academic gain we attach to our name. We're empty. Someone I've revered for a very long time died earlier this year, May the 7th, Jean Vanier. You may have read some of the obituaries of Jean Vanier's life. This was a Frenchman, died on May the 7th. He died 90 years of age founder of the L'Arche communities. You might not have heard of them, but it records the fact in The Economist, in the obituary at the back page, that he went to visit in the 1960s a village mental institution. He described it as a place of horror. He watched young men sitting around for the entirety of the day with no sense of active involvement, nothing to shift the mind. He saw them as he saw it, struck with an overwhelming and deep sense of sadness. And his own comment was that amidst the sadness shone the beauty of human spirits that were incarcerated in these mental institutions. Well, he made several visits and decided in discussions with his spiritual advisors the best thing he could possibly do was in four years later, in 1964, he would create a very different institution. He'd open a home, a very small house, in a place called Troy Bruel, a place that was falling to bits. It didn't have beautiful walls and nice carpets, but it simply was a place in which warmth, love, affection, commitment, shared meals, an open space for learning, Open-heartedness could be put in place as compared to institutional reform. Well, from this one building in 1964 sprang a network of 150 large communities in 38 countries, from India to the Ivory Coast, from Honduras to Palestine. And this is the comment from The Economist. Here, those with mental impairment and those without it lived and worked together as friends. Every person does what they can manage, whether baking bread or mending meals or mending tractors or, or binding books, and everyone has value. Communal meals were at the core of it. And, he comments, as Aristotle said, men cannot know each other until they have eaten salt together. Well, from that route, as the decades pass, he wrote over 30 books. He contributed to our understanding that those who society rejects and despises, walks by and dislikes, because often in the hearts of men and women, we see the weak as not like us, but even sometimes not human. And he said, that he was constantly inspired by the simplicity and joy of people that the world thought crazy. And he would sit with them, laughing with them. And he wondered how could he lead them to freedoms way beyond their circumstances. And he discovered that the freedom they wanted was not some great job or some economic prospect but it was to be heard, just to be heard. And so the large communities came to stand for that deep, empathetic, compassionate, emotional, intelligent significance. 
One of the men who I, when I was studying way back in the 1980s, I used to go and listen to on a weekly basis was a theologian called John Stott. And John Stott would speak at a church in London that's right next to the BBC called All Souls Langham Place. And I would often sit and listen to him. He could say more in five minutes than most people will say in 50. So I'm feeling threatened at the moment. But John was a brilliant, articulate, potent thinker, dedicated his life to sound analysis and sharpness of thought so that minds would be changed. And he wrote a little treatise on leadership based on a series of lectures that I remember sitting through in the 1980s, and I've kept it since that point to now. And I want to share with you just something of his reflection. I've just told you about the 55-year journey of Jean Vanier to empower those who no one would hear. Or this very important principle that the 29-year-old Katie Borman said, find the things that are invisible and focus on them. Develop the characteristics of life and the curiosity of mind which takes you beyond the material into the inner being of who you are. Well, John Stott spoke a lot about perseverance because nothing great is ever developed without a long arc of persistence. He said this, perseverance is an indispensable quality of leadership. It's one thing to dream dreams and to see visions. It's another to convert a dream into a plan of action. It's yet a third to persevere with it when opposition comes for opposition is bound to arise. As soon as the campaign gets underway, the forces of reaction muster. Entrenched privilege digs itself in more deeply. Commercial interests feel threatened and raise the alarm. The cynical sneer at the folly of do-gooders and apathy becomes transmuted into hostility. It's just as Machiavelli said. It's so hard to change things. But, said John Stott, a true work of God thrives on opposition. Its silver is refined. Its steel is hardened. Of course, those without the vision who are merely being carried along by the momentum of the campaign, they, they soon capitulate. So it is that the protesting youth of one decade become the conservative establishment of the next. Young rebels lapse into middle-class, middle-aged, middle-of-the-road mediocrity. Even revolutionaries, once the revolution's over, they lose their ideals, but not the real leader. For the real leader has the resilience to take setbacks in his stride, the tenacity to overcome fatigue and discouragement, and the wisdom to turn stumbling blocks into stepping stones. For the real leader adds to vision and industry the grace of perseverance. Yes, Machiavelli was right. It's hard to change things because it's hard to persevere. I sit in the parliament in London. We're having a fascinating time. And um, keep watching. It's not over yet. But when I'm speaking to many young men and women, I get the privilege to speak to each almost weekly, monthly, I like to tell them, remind them, that probably the single greatest achievement Westminster brought to the world, and even here to you in the United States, was to liberate the slaves. When Wilberforce fought the awkward battle of taking on that entrenched privilege of the slave owners, 
many of whom were in religious establishments. The church in England benefited massively from ownership of lands in the Caribbean, from the plantations that brought back what effectively had become the drug of England, sugar. This longing to get that which just gave us momentary stimulation caused millions to perish. And this little man, this social reformer, this, as one person described him, shrimp of an individual, the tiny little figure of William Wilberforce. He was said to have had an upturned nose and unattractive face. A little guy, yes, from privilege, but who came, it said, to be a social reformer possessing, and I love this quote of him, the virtues of a fanatic without the vices. He must be palpably single-minded and unself-seeking, strong enough to face opposition and ridicule, staunch enough to endure obstruction and delay. He made up his mind that as soon as he could, at the age of 20, he would become an elected member of parliament and he'd fight for one single cause alone. This abolition of what he called this enormous evil, so dreadful, so irredeemable, its wickedness appears that in my own mind, I'm completely made up, he said, for abolition. Let the consequences be what they will be. I, from this time on, am determined I'll never rest until I have effected the abolition. And he began. A slavery bill and a foreign slave bill in 1789. He lost. 1791. He lost. 1792. He lost. 1794. He lost. 1796. He lost. 1798. He lost. 1799. He lost. How many would have given up already? Well, the Foreign Slave Bill was not passed until 1806, and the abolition of slavery bill in 1807. Phase one was 18 years. Wilberforce became seriously ill. He had to resign from Parliament. He couldn't even physically walk to get there anymore, but the campaign must continue. And he said that his motto will be perseverance. Ultimately, he said, I trust the Almighty will crown our efforts with success. And in 1833, the abolition of slavery bill was passed in both houses of parliament in London, in Westminster. And herein lies the magic. After 40 Four years of fighting. Three days later, he died. His entire life was given to this. For the abolition of a trade so evil, so corrupting, so nasty, it took everything, but it set everyone Now, I know that slavery today remains a deeply ugly scar on modern life. It's not the slavery of the plantations. It's now often the slavery of young women. It's those taken in the lustful pursuits and idle-mindedness of our flesh. The fight goes on. As one chapter closes, another opens. Tracking back even before Machiavelli, even before the United States, Pericles wrote, he lived 495 to 429 BC. That's a long time ago. By anyone's measure of history, he said 
in a funeral oration these very, I think, punchy words for today. I've no wish, he said, to make a long speech on subjects that are familiar to all of you. What I want to do is this, to discuss the spirit in which we must face our trials. Our love of what is beautiful doesn't lead us, he said, to extravagance. Our love of the things of the mind doesn't make us soft. We make friends by doing good to others, not by receiving good from them. When we do kindness to others, we do not do them out of any calculation of profit or loss. We do them without afterthought, relying on our free liberality. I declare that in my opinion, each single one of our citizens in all of the manifold aspects of life is able to show himself the rightful lord and owner of his own person and to do this moreover with exceptional grace and exceptional versatility. In other words, you and I taking on the choice to be people of principles, values, determinations, and perseverances, we can love to deliver and deliver to love. All of us sit with this huge potency, which when an open-hearted people give themselves away, creates a society that is known for its extremes. Not its failures, but its extremes of significant and meaningful generosity. I read a briefing in Fortune magazine last year, which reflected on 10 years since the global financial crisis. You know what happened. You'll have studied it. You'll have read it. It's not that long ago. And we await the next one. And as Fortune magazine, which is the business Briefing magazine anticipates the next one. In an article written under the headline, How to Spot the Next Financial Crisis, it literally in its first opening paragraph said this. The main cause of the last crisis, human self-delusion and irrationality, will be the main cause of the next one. If that seems unbearably depressing, cheer up. It tells us what to watch out for. Human self-delusion and irrationality. How do we delude ourselves? We delude ourselves by being cynical, by giving in to the cancer of negative mindsets. We delude ourselves by being apathetic, by not thinking that the energy we can deploy is worth even that first step. We delude ourselves by being material, by forever measuring everything by what we possess, not by what we give. We delude ourselves by thinking that maybe the wisdom of the wise can be dispensed with in the age of automation and technology. We delude ourselves that markets know best. But in reality, souls must determine how markets function. Human self-delusion and irrationality. Well, in the same period of time, Martin Wolf, an economist, a British economist, was writing in the Financial Times a detailed assessment, which published on May the 1st this year, of how to build an alternative to the crisis that afflicted the world in 2008 to 2012. If we are heading towards another financial crisis, if banks cannot necessarily sustain the pressures borne in on them, and if economies will struggle, and for me, what that means is that the poor on the edge of life will just find it harder to make tomorrow work. And when I read, as I did last week, the United Nations' latest climate assessment report, which says that if we don't take the radical and determined steps towards genuine sustainable mitigation of climate impacts, 100 million more people 
will be added to the destitution register of the 860 million that remain. So nearly, instead of reversing the trend as we've seen in the last 30 years, will accelerate the trend to poverty simply because our lifestyle choices remain our delusion. Well, Martin Wolf wrote an article called The Politics of Hope Against a Politics of Fear. And in it, he expressed 10 critical principles. I'm just going to list them for you. But he begins with this assessment. Charismatic politicians, I don't know any, I'm sure you don't either. Charismatic politicians entice disillusioned people into giving them support. Some of these politicians are would-be despots. Others are scoundrels. Yet their siren songs are enticing. How then should politicians of the center right and the center left and those who support them respond? He says we must recognize we have to be in for a huge fight of the mind. And then he lists these principles. First, leadership really matters. It matters. It matters how we persuade people. It matters what we persuade them with. It matters with what information we give them. Truth, leadership matters. Secondly, competence matters. Things are not changed by the incompetent fiddling with things they don't understand. Competence is when those with ability apply it to improve circumstances. It's vital to put the discipline into making things better. Third, citizenship matters. It matters that we sit up and thank God for the freedoms we have and the moments we can open our minds and our thoughts and our mouths and we can declare, but we can't just declare, we must action that. By our day-to-day -day engagement and our votes, citizenship matters. Fourth, inclusion matters. Just as John Vanier did, we must bring people in, not push them out. The discomforts in other people are ways of learning how to love. Fifth, economic reform matters. It matters that people can be prosperous, but it doesn't matter that they can be excessively so. What matters is to balance economy with opportunity. Sixth, local matters. You can have visions for the world, but if you can't love your neighbor, you don't love at all. Seventh, public service matters. Public service is not just about those things we're forced to do as a duty, but the choices we make to involve ourselves in the uncomfortable corners of our society, our community, our relationships. Number eight, globalization and global cooperation matter because without it, we end up strangling others of their life. War is nasty and we need to learn how to cooperate. Ninth, looking ahead matters. Having a vision of the end from the beginning, understanding what it means to look beyond where we are and then long for a better world. And fifth, he says, complexity matters. Yes, the first of those World Economic Forum principles, complexity, it matters because in a complex world, simple solutions, ideological ideas are only valuable if you can work them through. He concludes, a politics that rests on popular anger and despotic whim is sure to fail. The only question is how. We must have a politics based on realism and in trying to do the right thing, to give the world the chance, the opportunity of a better outcome. Let me conclude with three thoughts. particularly those of you who are old and young. Remember, as General MacArthur said at the end of the Second World War, he who led the great fight of American forces 
in particular against the Japanese, that you don't become old because the years wrinkle away at your skin. You become old when you give up on your ideals. And in his remarks, he commented, you can be old at 17 or 70, but you remain young when you know there's a long journey ahead. And you must gather yourself with the energy to believe that you have to become adequate for the moment and keep the fight up. Yes, a possible candidate, but let's not go there. Marianne Williamson said these words quoted by Nelson Mandela. When he became president, he used her reflection. Our deepest fear, she said, Mandela said, is not that we're inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we're powerful beyond measure. It's our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not? You're a child of God. You're playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We're all meant to shine, as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is written within us. It's not just in some of us. It is potentially in all of us. Let us let our own light shine so that we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we liberate others, so they are liberated from their fears and us from ours. Look for the invisible. Gather up those qualities of life which are invisible and make them, yes, your north star, your pointer. I will seek after those qualities of character and perseverance, of determination and generosity and optimism and truth-seeking and love. I will seek after them. Make sure you seek the invisible and believe in the reality of the invisible. Number two, don't accept. Don't accept that the things that are fixed are forever fixed because they're not. Change is always possible. It just needs you to start. And number three, gather the others and take them with you. Because, as Emerson said, without enthusiasm, nothing great is ever achieved. But for great things to be achieved, we need to journey together. To make the fight of the enthusiasts a collective fight. To choose things that are tough and hard to do and willing to wander and put ourselves to the task and fight until the day is finished well. Thank you for your time, and I pray God's blessing on all of you. Thank you, Lord Hastings, uh, for taking the time to be with us and sharing, sharing a piece of you with us. Um, I hope we all take what he said into our hearts and, and make it a part of our leadership as we go forward.